Hello, everybody at Sun Baptist Church. I can't wait to be with you again, Lord willing, on July the 21st. Now, I need you to do something. Get the word out. I'm going to be preaching a very special message about America and uh, the issues that face us in this terrible, terrible current situation that we have in our culture, this very, very sad time. And to give you a little bit of a taste of it, today's message is very vital. It'll set the table for what I'm going to share on July the 21st. And I'd like for you to take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 16. The book of Revelation chapter 16 and beginning with verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet for they are the spirits of the devil or as some Bibles say, devils, plural. The mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet. Satan tries to copy everything God does. God has a holy trinity of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Satan has an unholy trinity. The dragon, that's the devil. The dragon. And then the beast, that's the Antichrist. And the false prophet. That's the unholy trinity. We are beginning to see emerge, as I never suspected that it would in my lifetime, unless Jesus came immediately we are beginning to see the emergence of that unholy trinity of Satan, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. I say unprecedented emergence because that's what it is. It doesn't take anybody with very much intelligence to see that horrible evil is literally covering the landscape of America and around the world. If you go back in your history, back to the 30s, the 1930s, and if you study very much about the Nazis as they were taking their millions of Jewish neighbors to their ultimate deaths in gas chambers, as they paraded them down the street, the Jews did not know where they were going. They were simply in a forced march that had the more feeling of a parade. And all along the way, the Nazis, with evil in their heart, cunning in their souls, were throwing beautiful flowers at them. Beautiful flowers, roses and lilacs all kinds of flowers, buttercups. And at the same time, all along the way, they either had live bands, live instrumentation, or recordings of beautiful German music. Why all seemed to be well, it seemed to be beautiful. The Jews did not know it, but they were marching to a beautiful fragrance and a beautiful music interlude to their awful deaths. I look at America today, and especially at our young people, and especially because of the entertainment world, the educational world, and the sports world. They are being led away from life that is found in Jesus Christ. 
marching silently to the excitement and thrill of the modern day music, the bands, the rock stars, the most prominent athletes. Oh yes, excitement is everywhere in America. But it's not the excitement and joy that ought to come with music and thrill. If we listen closely, it's more of a funeral dirge. It's a, it's a sad following of the dead soul of America to our own destruction, even as America is headed toward destruction. I especially am concerned about young people hearing what's coming out as I just read, of the mouth of the dragon, hearing what's coming out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, hearing what's coming out of the mouth of the false prophet, because remember, you can't trust them. The Bible tells us that Satan is the father of lies. It's all nothing but a shell game. It's all nothing but smoke and mirrors. It's nothing more than deception. But our young people and our adults, I'm I'm so afraid. And even those who are within the church are being misguided, misled to their own destruction. And they're not listening to anybody say anything that will disturb them. Don't forget, don't forget. The Bible tells us that Satan has come to kill, to steal, to destroy. I want every one of you that are listening to me just to understand something. You are not beyond being a target for the devil. He wants to kill you. He wants to steal everything that's precious to you. He wants to destroy you. And one of the ways he's doing it, and especially with young people, is in the entertainment world. I don't believe that I've ever seen a time when music has so captivated the hearts and the very souls of our young people. Godless, dark, evil music. Music that we call rock, some pop, some heavy metal, and yes, even country music. And yes, even some southern gospel music. And yes, even some contemporary music. Satan's not one who cares which mode or medium of music he uses to attack the minds of young people and even adults. It doesn't bother him at all. As long as he's able to pull them away from God and loving God. Just to pull them away. Remember, Satan was in charge of the music in heaven before God kicked him out because of his rebellion. He knows music. Satan knows music. Satan knows the pull and the seduction of music. And he knows the hold that it can have, especially on the minds of young people. He knows it. There is a church in Nashville, Tennessee that I personally think is a great church. It's more in the Pentecostal tradition. It's called Christ Church. It started out as a very small church. A great man of God by the name of C.H. Hardwick started it. And it grew beyond his belief. They have a recording contract with their choir. Their choir is really, really good. So far as I know, it's the only church in America with perhaps the exception of the Brooklyn Tabernacle that has a recording contract. Great choir. Many of the professional singers in Nashville go to this church, whether they're country or Southern gospel or contemporary, then you'll go on there because of the music. On one occasion, I did a funeral with C.H. Hardwick. In fact, I've told you before, 
I led J.D. Summers to the Lord. His wife died in 1992. He asked me to leave a crusade that I was conducting in Texas. And I came back to Nashville. C.H. Hardwick was also involved in leading in that funeral. And so we had a time to meet each other and chat. And he said something to me that I really thought about. He said, Harold, there are many entertainers who start out well. Virtually all the entertainers in America, whether it's gospel music, country music, or rock and roll, started out singing in churches. And those that start coming to Christ's church, I tell them, Singing is not enough to keep you right with God. You've got to have the preached word. You've got to sit under the preached word because the Bible says it's the foolishness of preaching that causes men to believe. And he said, let me tell you what happens. I've seen it often, he said, at Christ Church. Country singers come in, gospel singers come in, contemporary singers come in. And if they are in church somewhere on a Sunday, they are there because they've been asked to come and perform. So Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, basically they are there doing a concert. And month after month after month goes by that they do not hear the preached word of God. And then the next thing I hear, he says, as the pastor of Christ church, is they have backslidden. They're deep into sin. They have fallen away from God. And it's simply for this reason, and he said, I tell them this. Satan doesn't care if you go to the house of God. He really doesn't care. It doesn't bother him at all if you're there to entertain instead of being challenged and fed by the preached word of God. He could care less. So Satan didn't just stop with rock music, although rock music is horrible. Rock music is horrible. I led a rock singer to the Lord. Not extremely well known. If I mentioned his name, you wouldn't know him, but he was playing at that time in a very well-known rock band, nationally known rock band. He began to tell me what brought him to the Lord. He said, you would be absolutely amazed at what I saw while I was traveling in that rock band. He said there was one radio station in the southwestern United States that had us come down, and, and the men I was traveling with, they were ungodly men of the worst sort. I didn't feel good around them, but there was all the applause of the fans, and that was like adrenaline, and I enjoyed it. And I made a lot of money. But this radio station is particular city where we were going, had a contest pointed toward young people. And whoever they chose after asking a question, if they chose that young person, that young person would get free tickets to the concert. And the question was this, what would you be willing to do in order to get these tickets to hear this man. What would you be willing to do? And they answered. Some of the answers were answers that I could never describe to you in a mixed audience, and I would not. They were so dirty and so filthy. But one 13-year-old girl said, I would give my body to the band members. They could do with it what they wanted. 
even if I ended up black and blue because they are like gods to me. No, they are more than gods. And she was not the one that won the, t the tickets. There were descriptions of other things that were even worse than that. Now listen to what her mother said. Her mother was asked about that, and her mother said, well, I took her answer. I took her answer down to the radio station and gave it to them myself. Oh, I don't really believe my daughter meant that because after all, my daughter is a very committed Christian. You talk about a twisted view of Christianity, friend. I can't think of anything that is more than that. And then this young man that I led to the Lord said something else. He said, Dr. Hunter, there was a time that the only place you could buy pornography was in an adult bookstore. What parents don't know, but the devil does. A lot of the rock music magazines a lot of the rock music magazines have nothing but some stories about music, yes, but a lot of stories about the language that's in the songs and pornographic articles that would make you blush if you read them. So that when our kids buy those magazines that parents may think are harmless music magazines, they are actually allowing their young people to buy pornography. But Satan's very sly. He's the dragon. Remember, it's coming from the mouth of the dragon. He knows there's a limit as to how far even parents will go before they get wise when they suddenly see what's happening. So he tries to clean it up a little bit. Now, what I'm about to say, some of you are not going to like. I may very well, if it gets out, I may very well lose invitations to churches. But let me preface it by saying this. The last time I pastored a church was in 1990, and I said at that time, it is very, very, very difficult to pastor a church. Listen, that was a Sunday school class back then to what pastors must endure in our culture today. Because in our culture today, it's almost a demand that that church grow or else the pastor must look at himself as a failure. So in order not to be a failure, he's got to make it grow numerically. He's got to do it. He's going to lose his job. And here is the difficulty. Even if a pastor decides, I am not going to change what I preach, here's his problem. How far does he let the organization and the social activities of his church go toward the world before he's crossed the line and gone too far in the world. Now, I'm going to tell you, that takes the wisdom of Solomon. How far should the world, how far should the church go in reaching the world before it's become too much like the world and not enough like the church? I think that's something to really consider, don't you? You know, I can, I can hear the voice of Satan as he whispers into the ears of leaders of churches. Just get them to come. I mean, it's a good thing. Just get them to come. Lighten up on the Bible study. Lighten up on the preaching. 
be a little bit more broad-minded, be a little bit more tolerant. Because after all, once they come, you're going to preach the gospel to them. I've told you about the sin of Jeroboam, so you'll remember it. But Jeroboam had the northern kingdom after Israel split. His half-brother Rehoboam was in the south at Jerusalem. And when the people each year went off for a sacrifice, they had to go to Jerusalem. Well, Jeroboam didn't want them to go down there because his half-brother Rehoboam would turn the people against him. So he found some places that he would call holy places in the north. And to get the people to come there, he'd get them the fun of the world, which included male prostitutes for the women, female prostitutes for the men, and he justified it by saying, well, the crowds are coming, and then we'll worship Jehovah. I want to ask you a question. What's the difference in that? And saying, we're going to have some worldly fun at church. And that'll get the people to come. And then we'll preach to them. A huge, a huge Pentecostal church. Not too long ago, had a man take off his shirt, be bare chested, and do a dance on a pole that you would more likely see in a strip joint. And he did it in a quote unquote worship service. Have we lost our minds? But he had a crowd there. And see the way that Satan dresses all this up. He does it by confusing people. Just like in that instant, with a man on a strip pole bare-chested. It was in a church building. See, it was done under the name of God. And young people especially get all confused. They weren't doing this at a strip joint. They weren't doing this at a nightclub. They weren't doing this in anything else but a church, for heaven's sakes. And it confuses them about what Christianity really is. In 1975, I cut a record. Some of you have heard it. In Nashville, Tennessee. Back then, they didn't have computers to do the backup sound. You had to have live singers or live musicians. I was lucky enough to have the best-known recording engineer in Nashville, Tennessee, a man by the name of Tommy Strong. He got for us Elvis Presley's first drummer, DJ Fontana, and Elvis's guitarist, one of his guitarists, Duke Dumas, and then Perry Como's organist, BG Cruiser. So I chatted a little bit with DJ Fontana. I already knew this, or I'd heard it, but he confirmed it. Elvis didn't drink beer or any kind of wine or liquor. He didn't take illegal drugs. What got Elvis was prescribed drugs, but he didn't allow any kind of alcohol at Graceland or any of his concerts. And he said, I have often seen Elvis before a performance. As we're getting ready to go out on stage, people would start looking for him and he'd be on his knees in his private bathroom behind stage on his knees, talking to God and crying. And he said to me something that J.D. Sumner echoed later when I got to really know J.D. If Elvis had lived, he would have probably gone entirely into singing Christian music or to some kind of ministry because that's where his heart was. But see, Satan seduced him out into the world because he had that extraordinary voice. And that's what gets these young people to go. And we who are in the church are sometimes idiots. 
some time back, Taylor Swift did three concerts in Nashville, Tennessee on a Sunday at the football stadium down there. And it was packed out. There was such a lightning storm, the third concert, which was slated to start at 8 o'clock, and I couldn't, they couldn't start it till 11 o'clock or so, but the crowd stayed. What happened to such commitment to the church? There was then a time not too that long ago in America that the only way you were going to fill a football stadium was either with a football team or a Billy Graham crusade. What happened, folks? And don't you know that that is an enticement to our young people? By the way, I saw where tickets to that concert in the newspaper, the reporter said, I have seen where people have paid forty and fifty thousand dollars to be able to take a couple of their teenage children to see that. This is a dangerous time for the church. I can't believe I can't I can't begin to tell you how dangerous the time is. It's an awful and a dangerous time. It's a dangerous time. I, for one, believe that the church needs to take a stand and say we will be the church. We are going to be a church. We are going to stand for truth. We are going to proclaim the truth. We're not going to give one inch. What the Bible says, that we will do. Our kids need to have a place that is an anchor for their soul. And I'll tell you another thing in America that's absolutely gripping the hearts of people. Coming from the mouth of the dragon and coming from the mouth of the beast and coming from the mouth of the false prophet, nothing but lies. And that's the mass media. The mass media as far as I'm concerned, is better known by far for its lies than its truth. I saw where one of the mass media was approached about the truthfulness of the source that they were quoting. And the answer was this. I don't care about the truthfulness of the source. What we are trying, to, what we in the mass media are trying to do, what we are trying to do is to mold public opinion. Now think about that a minute. We don't care about the truthfulness of the source. We are trying to mold public opinion. And you are a fool if you think the real rulers of America are the ones you elect to office. I am of the opinion the real rulers of America are the national networks, their polling systems, because our idiot elected officials are more concerned about looking at those poll results and seeing which way the wind is blowing and then to make rules, regulations, and laws that confirm what they see in those poll results. I noticed another thing coming from the mouth of the dragon. The mass media knows that the average American doesn't like the word communist. You never hear the word communist. Now, you may hear socialist. Occasionally, you may hear Marxist. Most of the time, left-wing Friend, you better mark it down. We are headed toward communism. And communism is best known among everything else that's bad about it as being anti-God. And if anybody in the media picks up what I'm saying, I got news for you. 
the best known song in America is not your latest hit in rock music. The best known song in America is Amazing Grace. And guess what's number two? The Old Rugged Cross. Now, you may not like it, but Americans at their heart, whether they're black, white, yellow, or red, they love the sound of music that glorifies God. And guess what's the most familiar name in America? You're not going to like it, but it's Jesus. You know why you don't like it being Jesus? I wish I had every cameraman and every anchor and every reporter in front of me. You don't like the name Jesus because you hate God. You don't have a problem with Mohammed or Islam or Muslim, but you hate God. And as far as I'm concerned, the average reporter out there for these major networks and major newspapers, you have the morals of a hog. You're trying to get America to roll around in a, in a mud bath. I'm praying that God will bring a generation of preachers that will not let that happen. And what you'd really like, what you would really like, what people who are in the media would really like, they'd really like to see the fall of America and all of us lose the freedoms that have been afforded to us, not by the Constitution. It's guaranteed by the Constitution but those that wrote the Constitution said the freedoms we have were granted to us by God. But you hate God, so you'd like to see America fall. And finally, you know where the most dangerous place in America is for you to be? You know where the most dangerous place in America is for a young person? probably the pew of the average church. Whatever happens down at the crack house, whatever happens down at the rock concert, whatever happens at the nightclub, that's only temporary. But when you sit in a church, there's no talking about the blood, no talking about salvation, no talking about heaven or hell. We're talking about an eternal decision that could damn your soul. And it would be awful. It would be awful. I have two examples of that. I never will forget it as long as I live. If I have time, I'll share both of them. If I don't, I'll share one. I'll never forget it. I was... Um, on Let's Ask the Pastor, which, as you know, was a program when I was pastor of North Jacksonville that played every day here in Jacksonville on Radio 1050. And it was during drive time, and I would take Bible questions and answer them. And I'll never forget I'll never forget. A young woman called in. And she said, my life is terrible. And she began to tell me about her life. It was a dirty, awful, awful life. I, Elvin Hall, who is now with the Lord, was the owner of the station. I, I figured at any time he would pull the plug, but he didn't. And she talked about all the sordid, ugly, awful things she had done. And we talked a while, and I could tell she was desperate. And then she said, I think what I'm going to do is commit suicide. I have a gun here with me. I'm going to commit suicide. And I talked with her, and I talked with her. And I knew it was desperate. I, I knew 
I knew this thing is getting out of hand. So I said, do you have a husband? No. Any children? No. What about parents? Well, my mother is alive in Louisiana. I said, your mother is going to be crushed if you take your life. I know that, but I can't help it. I can't help it. I've done everything I can to straighten up my life. I can't straighten it up. I've gone too far. I've done too much that's bad. I cannot be forgiven. I, I, I just, life is over for me. I didn't know what to say. I said everything I could say, but I could tell. I could tell she was very desperate. And this wasn't going to end very well. She had turned on the radio so that when the gunshot went off, maybe nobody would hear it. She intended to turn it up loud and quote unquote, just happened to come to my program. I've too, too, too much that's bad. My mother can never forgive me. Nobody can ever forgive me. I've done too much that's bad. So, suddenly, the Spirit of God touched my heart and told me something to tell her. I really, truly believe it was from God. I said, look up at me. In your mind's eye, look up. If you're looking down, look up. It was a radio, so I don't know she wasn't there, but I've felt in my soul she's looking at the floor I said look up as though you're looking into my eye and listen to what I'm saying God says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and suddenly I heard sobbing on the other side and she said Dr. Hunter help me Help me do that. And I explained to her the simple old, old story. If she would repent and trust Jesus, he would save her. And she did that. She did that. And I chatted with her a little bit more. Oh, I would say about a month later, I was at the radio station in Elwin Hall said, I got a phone call and somebody left a number for you to call them. And I called and it was this lady's mother in Louisiana. She said, oh, Dr. Hunter, my daughter got caught up in rock music and alcohol and then drugs and broke my heart. But she's come home, Dr. Hunter. She's come home. I just want to thank her. I said, don't thank me. I didn't die for her at Calvary. Jesus died for her. Oh, oh, I've got my daughter back. I've got my daughter back. Some of you know how much I love the ministry of a Methodist evangelist that I consider to be the greatest evangelist that ever lived by the name of Sam Jones from Cartersville, Georgia. I won't go into it. Look him up sometime. Samuel Porter Jones. You'll be amazed at the work that he did. I knew that he had held a crusade in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1895, and they drew 50,000 a night. They closed 256 saloons that year because of all the men that got saved. And during that following year, the, the saloon didn't have business. I heard they had printed his sermons each morning in the Cincinnati Enquirer. So I called the Enquirer office and asked if I could get copies of the 
sermons. And the lady that answered said, no, newspaper's that old. We've already sent to microfilm at the public library. So I called the librarian over there. The young lady answered the phone. And she said, yes, I can find them and I'll send you copies. So three or four days later, she called me to tell me she'd found them. And then she started crying when we got through talking business. And I said, can I help you? She said, I turned my back on God, broke the heart of my mama. I said, there is no God. I sunk into drugs. I've been any man's woman that wanted me. My life's been off. And I just didn't know what to do. And then I found one of these sermons that was preached in 1885 up here by Sam Jones. What must I do to be saved? And I read it. And God touched my heart, Brother Hunter. And I got down on my knees by my equipment here. And I gave my heart to Jesus. And I feel clean. I said, so what are you going to do now? My mama don't know it. This was on a Friday. My mama don't know it, but I know where she'll be on Sunday. She'll be on the third row of her church over in Illinois. I'm going to travel to Illinois. And as they're singing, I'm going to slip in, sit down beside my mama, put my arm around her, give her a hug and say, Mama, I'm home. I'm home. See, that's what Jesus can do. Our young people need to know, don't listen to the entertainment world. Don't listen to the sports world. Don't listen to the political world. Listen to Jesus and come home. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.